journalist and science communicator. He uh, is a freelance photographer at National Geographic and a contributing photographer at Sky and Telescope. And he's the founder and director of The World at Night, which is um, a fabulous program that uh, involves 50 photographers uh, sharing, sharing the um, uh, night sky with, uh, with uh, the public. And uh, I first discovered the world at night during uh, the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. And uh, uh, I know that you know, everyone in this organization is, uh, knows that images of the sky uh, are what uh, uh, bring people to our science, uh, but also are what everyone shares. And I think the, the box philosophy of, um, you know, we're all under one sky uh, is something particularly appropriate for the times and the season. And so uh, I think we're really looking forward to your talk. And uh, uh, it's being webcast, by the way, so uh, on the Science Education Department YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to uh, suggest anybody to see it later, uh, it'll be available. Great. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be in this auditorium again. Uh, I think my previous talk was in 2006, almost 10 years ago, for another group of uh, mostly perhaps amateur astronomers of Boston area. Um, but today it's a different topic because during the past 10 years I've worked on this project called The World at Night and invited photographers from around the world to come to our group. Most of them are professionally living from this type of photography, which is a bizarre job. I mean, it's a very small market and uh, it's a very challenging job too because you need to travel a lot and there are a lot of risks to take at night in these um, far and remote locations. And there are many security issues. I will explain some of these challenges that the photographer really face, uh, usually during every every trip they, they go um, mainly to World Heritage sites. 
But the story of Tuan is actually a bit beyond uh, astronomy. So we, of course, are an astronomy outreach program. But the message itself is just to communicate people from another perspective, that night sky is part of our life. So that's the main goal. Then when they get this sense of night sky being an element of our regular life, uh, the, this wall between us and people, between us and science, might be um, less difficult to break. That's why we use many elements of art, culture, and then bridge it with science through these images, and also with the text of, and the caption of the images. Perhaps it's best uh, said by this person saying that night hides a world but reveals a universe. So to me, night sky and exploring the night sky even with unaided eyes, it's similar to going to a mountaintop or inside a cave. And you just come back and like to share this experience with the rest of people. But there are two kinds of imagery. One is images of sky isolated. Some of them are wide field like this, some are deep sky images. And the, the, the other is a night escape photo, night sky land escape, which we call it now night escape. And this combination of earth and sky in these images are the main uh, bridge that we use because people find these known landmarks, a historic uh, building or a natural site designated by UNESCO. So everyone knows about it in the world. But then they see the night sky above it in a real picture. And they can communicate with night sky beyond being an isolated part of deep universe, but part of their life. The image itself here is a fisheye view from Alma, uh, over 5,000 meters high, 15,000 feet. And I just took it uh, right at the break of dawn in the morning twilight when, where the southern Milky Way is over the zenith. Um, so th you don't see the dishes because um, I cropped it to just to have the view of the uh, night sky. But all around are this over 60 radio telescope or more accurately sub-millimeter uh, observatory. Some of our images are not really uh, an astrophoto because you don't see any message of astronomy here, unless, uh, you know, except for some stars. The stars are used as decoration. Some images are made uh, with the purpose of astronomy, so educators, science journalists can use them to talk to people about principles of astronomy and stargazing. But some are just general night escape. For example, this is just a combination of three layers uh, from photography point of view. And it's a play of light with the road illuminating this rock in Iran. This is the Alborz Mountains, the highest mountain in the Middle East called Mount Damoban. It's a legendary mountain for Persian culture too. It's over 5,600 meters. It's a volcano and uh, very symmetrical too. But there is nothing about astronomy in the picture other than general um, atmosphere of night sky. So that's why we have uh, various terms. For example, night escape photography, landscape astrophotography, when it's more specific, uh, specified towards astronomy, we can use this term. Some people use star escape photography, not very common, earth and sky photography. And there are a variety of uh, light and illumination in these images. So it's perhaps the most challenging part of this photography is not about the camera and technique, but how to handle the night, uh, the lights at night. For example, in this image, it's an old picture I made um, almost 10 years ago with one of my early digital cameras. It's again in Alborz Mountains of Iran in a winter night, pretty cold night. But um, the interesting part of the picture is the combination of a road illuminating Light pollution, even light pollution is useful to many of these images. And then the moon itself, because uh, the blue cast over the sky is only made either by the moon or twilight, and this was the moon. So foreground illumination could be twilight, moon, artificial lights, even the starlight and the Milky Way, zodiacal light, aurora, and even air glow. 
can cast some light in your picture. So what is the illumination here? It's almost like a daylight picture. Since it's very uniform, obviously it's the moon. There is nothing, no, no other source can make this uniform illumination over Taide National Park and the El Taide Volcano on the Canary Island of Tenerife. It's the highest mountain in the Atlantic Ocean and the highest mountain of Spain, but not located in the mainland of Spain, far off, near Africa, in fact. And this is a very interesting uh, plant called Tahinaste, flowering plant almost two meter high. Only grow in on these few islands. From Canary Islands, now we start the tour to various. So, what is the illumination on this picture? It's a self illuminated. I use a small uh, studio light and I uh, illuminate it from its locations. We go to another World Heritage site here in the US, the Yellowstone two, three different angles um, just to have something uniform because we had some light from the nearby town casting yellow on this so it was too much yellow. You can see some shadows. These are the light from the village. I was trying to reduce that with my uh, studio light. Then in the sky you can find the Milky Way and just over um, in the center is Antares, the heart of a scorpion. From U.S., we are back in Iran, in another mountainous area. And illumination is the moon and this village itself. In the sky, Sirius and Orion, the prominent figures of the winter sky. Now we are back in the U.S. again. You have already got this sense of breaking the borders when you are just switching from Iran to U.S. in every two pictures. You're going across the, across the world. We are in Grand Teton National Park. Uh, perhaps we can dim the light a bit more. Yeah, or I can do it here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you bring up oh, the shades, okay. I'll channel it into the channels and try to get the whole thing down. Oh, so if okay. we bring them up, up uh, blinds yes. up. Oh, okay. And then I'll do it. Yeah, this, some people uh, regard a um, group of my picture as fine art. Like, for example, National Geographic has a project called Nat Geo Fine Art. They start galleries uh, in different parts of the world. The four beginning galleries are in Hawaii and Florida and Los Angeles area. And this one is one of the best-selling uh, images in their gallery so far. So I'm quite amazed, yes, that people regard astrophotography as fine art too. Definitely not shut down system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lighting. All right, yeah, it's tight, it's tight. You want slide? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So please don't sleep. <laughs> but since there are so many details in uh, dark areas of the picture, it's better to have a very dim light uh, condition. What you see in the sky is quite unique because so far in 20 years of astrophotography I did, I've never seen such a strong air glow. So this night was quite an occasion and uh, the air glow was not only intense, it was also in variety of patterns and it was there for a couple of hours. And you usually don't see red and green air glow so mixed up together in one area of the sky. So it was very unique to me. And of course, I enhance the color and contrast to show more of the patterns of air glow. Um, for those who are not familiar, air glow is the natural emission of the Earth's upper atmosphere. 
So it's a chemical emission and uh, by warming up the molecules in the Earth atmosphere. It usually happens in 60, 70 miles above us. It's in green and red, and it's very faint in visible light, but it's stronger in infrared. Uh, the naked eye, human naked eye, cannot pick the color of air glow, but you can see the, the pattern when it's uh, strong enough. But the camera can, of course, record the color. I was there mainly to repeat an image which most, perhaps most in, inspired me in photography. It was a picture by Ansel Adams uh, called Snake River and Teton. So it's showing this a snake river going toward, towards Teton in a perfect black and white picture I had always in mind to repeat it at night with the stars. But then I, when I got there, I realized in seven decades these trees has grown so high that you can't actually <laughs> see the Snake River anymore. <laughs> so some pictures, as I said, are not astronomy related but just showing the general night atmosphere like this one. is a telephoto image of uh, this towering cumulus cloud uh, in Hawaii. The, the image is made from Haleakala summit, very close to the observatory in fact, and you can see the illumination of the night sky is um, partly by the lightning, by the strike. I was uh, lucky to capture this in two cameras, so in the second camera it's a wide field and um, the Milky Way and this one is captured in a single panoramic shot. Single, single exposure means the exposure of all these images made in, in this mosaic are, were the same. So it was just one single exposure. It's not a blend of exposures or so-called HDR. And from that sense, it's quite um, amazing to me because uh, there is a large dynamic range in this uh, area. What is the illumination here? You can obviously see there is some illumination on the rocks. The image is made by my colleague Alex Cherney from Victoria, Australia. And the most amazing part is obviously the illumination comes from the galaxy. So the galactic bulge is illuminating the rocks. You can see the shadows. And when it's so dark, and especially when you're in southern hemisphere, when the when, where the Milky Way appearing brighter because it's higher up the center of the galaxy. It's possible. So Tuan photographers are more or less, all of them are involved with the business of astrophotography too. Um, that means they're living from this. Some of them are using even analog cameras like my colleague Oshin Zakarian is using digital and analog together. His camera is 20 years older than him. <laughs> but he likes this art part of photography because photography is always a combination of technique, art, and the moment. So, so for some of us, the moment is more important for some, the art and technology. The group is growing. At the moment, we have four new Tuan members, uh, which I need to add to this um, picture. Every year, we invite one or two new members. And... Um, Unfortunately, as you can see, there is no female Tuan photographer with us at the moment, so it's a men club, but it will change very soon. Uh, for some reason, female photographers were not active in this area. Perhaps it was too much challenging or it was not well introduced, but we tried to resolve this issue in our workshops, and it's happening. In Tuan contest every year, we have more and more female winners. Soon we will invite the first uh, Tuan female member. But they're they from. Have a right there. <laughs> oh, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so these are from uh, 2022 countries um, almost across the world. Some of them are even local people, like Dennis DiCicco up there. He is a Sky and Telescope, long time a Sky and Telescope editor. Uh, some are quite well known people in astronomy, like. Um, David Malin, he is not only a photographer of Tuan, he's one of our best advisors. 
And he, he was very inspiring to all of us. Uh, although he's not really a night escape photographer, he has used the uh, largest telescopes of his time. So the difference between a night escape and deep sky photo is not only in the technology, also it's about the huge difference of field of view. If you look at the picture of Orion Nebula on the right side, it's a mosaic by Hubble, then you can find it as a point in our picture on the left side, uh, just below the Orion belt marked by a square. The picture on the left uh, might be interesting to you. It's from the site of Iran National Observatory. They're hoping to make um, a 3.5 meter telescope up here with an international collaboration if, we can, if they can break this isolation on top of this mountain. And the seeing on this mountain is very, very unique for the area. So that's why it's a very uh, interesting project to them. Another combination of deep sky and wide field images, uh, starting from this panorama from Alps, Austria. Um, in Europe, there are not so many places left to see the natural night sky. This is definitely one of them in Tyrol of Austria. Now we are going to zoom over to Antares at the heart of Scorpion. This picture is already away from night escape. There is no Earth in this picture. It's still a single exposure showing Antares and this bizarre little star next to it. It's, it's a bit unusual to the rest of the stars. And then when you look closer in a deep sky photo, you realize you're dealing with a globular cluster. So this uh, transfer, the transition from night escape to deep sky is very educational to people. They can communicate now with this isolated picture of the universe, at, le at least from the scale uh, in the night sky. Sometimes we even try deep sky and night escape together in a single shot. It was, um, it has been always an interest to me, but since uh, the cameras were limited in sensitivity in the past, it was very difficult. Now it's more, more um, successful when you try a single exposure of a deep sky object and some sort of landscape. For example, this one is only 15 second exposure on a very high ISO, a modified camera, and a fast lens, and of course, observatory class night sky from La Palma, Canary Islands. In a 15 second, you can see the horse head nebula, the dark nebula over here, or even the M78, so reflection nebula, and some others like the flame nebula, a lot of details of Orion. It's quite interesting to see all of these in a single shot. It's not the main style of Tuan because we usually try to show people what they can see with, with their own eyes. But this is far beyond that, unless they modify their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so these are main, uh, mainstream of Tuan photography. In the center, you see the Big Deeper, or some major. Blossoms, uh, these are apple blossoms in, in a very nice village in northern Iran. From Iran, we are now in this area, New Hampshire, during the fall colors. Yeah. It's not a good idea to do a long exposure on this road. <laughs> From New Hampshire, now we are in Azores, Portugal. Well, it's far from Portugal. It belongs to Portugal. Azores is a group of wonderful islands in the Atlantic Ocean, midway from here to Europe. I was there just a few weeks ago, but this picture is from a couple of years ago, and they have amazing night sky, unfortunately not visible usually because of clouds. So it's very challenging to get such pictures there because you have this clear sky, 10 minutes later, it's raining. Now to Iceland, another mid-Atlantic island. And Iceland is a heaven for geologists, uh, for, of course, tourists looking for trekking and hiking, but also it's a location to see Aurora Borealis because of the latitude. So I was there for a workshop, and then I realized there is this big sunspot on the sun coming towards the facing part of the sun. 
facing the Earth. That means any eruption happening from that sunspot is probably reaching the Earth as a solar uh, storm, geomagnetic storm. So I was waiting for it, and it happened. It, it happened to be one of the best um, aurora storm we had for years. Closer view, all colors. Now we are in Canary Island of La Palma. The observatory is up here. You can see a few of the domes. And the observatory is built right at the edge of this giant caldera. In the sky, uh, Saturn is up over there next to Antares and the Milky Way. And the evening twilight is fading away. To Nepal and Himalayas. Illumination is gained by the moon and uh, the altitude of the location, photography location is about 4,000 meters. Uh, some of those peaks are 7,000, like on the left, far left is 8,400, one of the highest in the world. It was 20 seconds. Many of my exposures where you see pinpoint stars are between 10 to 30 seconds. Then it becomes a longer exposure, you capture star trails. Like this one is only five seconds because I didn't want the people to uh, appear blurry. You know, more than five seconds they move. Definitely they move. Unless they were one of these models from early stage of photography in 1840s, 1850s. They were, you know, standing still against the camera for several minutes. So these were, these were my guides in Sahara Tassili National Park of Algeria. It was a project for Algeria National Observatory to find some of the locations for astronomical observation and stargazing in general. But we also went to some of the natural um, heritage of the country. So Tassili is an amazing place for dark sky, of course, but it's also very... Um, very good place to see snakes and scorpion, if you want to see them. <laughs> well, I was not really planning to see them. <laughs> but there were so many of them because we were there late in the season. At night it was uh, 35 degrees Celsius, so it was pretty warm at night. You know, I've moved to Boston to the U.S. less than a year, so I'm still on Celsius and meters, so sorry about that. <laughs> To Australia, an image by my, wherever an image is made by a colleague, I mentioned the name, Kwan Ochul is Tuan photographer in Korea. He traveled to Western Australia and captured his shots of large and small Magellanic cloud in a moonlit night over a baobab tree. Now we are in Brazil. There's a little meteor just next to the Milky Way in the picture, Antares again is up there, the center of the galaxy is right over those palm trees, the direction. And there is a challenge for every picture, like Sahara going far into the desert. The challenge here was simply the falling coconuts. And you know, they were falling very quickly, every few minutes next to the camera. <laughs> So from Brazil, now we are in Kilimanjaro area. The iconic mountain, the roof of Africa, is best seen from southern Kenya while it's located in Tanzania. Uh, the challenge here was wandering animals, of course. Um, I was outside of the camp, so it's a possible encounter with lions, but not very likely in this area, but it's not also impossible. Uh, I encountered with few giraffes during the photography. They were here and there, but they didn't close, get, get very close to me. Uh, the large and the small Magellanic cloud, the small one is right at the horizon in this picture, but the large one is very prominent. If you look in the sky, there is a surprising um, purple-red area on the upper left. Can you, can you see it? Do you have any idea what it is? This is the largest emission nebula in this area of the sky. It's almost 40 degrees wide. I think it's the largest 
um, supernova remnant in the sky. It's called GAM, one of the GAM nebulae. So you can see it's in uh, constellation Vela. The Southern Cross is right at the horizon over Kilimanjaro. So this place is at the equator. That's why the southern uh, elements of the sky are not getting very high up. So sometimes it's about the sense of nature. Like this picture by Todd Wysoski from Colorado, another Tuan member mainly doing uh, time-lapse imaging is a meteor during Perseid meteor shower. But then he recorded the actual sound during photography time. So this is the actual sound from there at night, that moment. We even had an exhibition where people could listen to some of the sounds recorded during uh, the photography. It was very interesting, the reaction from people, because they see the night sky now from another sense. So some images are just general night escape, and this was from the same location uh, with Kilimanjaro, but in a different night I was looking for giraffe and finally captured them at night against Kilimanjaro. I was with a guide, one of the uh, tribe, tribal people uh, living in this area in the national park, and he was a special guide to find animals at night. So he could see them, I couldn't. You know, he, he was showing me, shoot that direction. I was shooting, and there was the giraffe, but I couldn't see anything. With my eyes. <laughs> Here's a closer view. Actually, you can see there are two of them. One is eating, the other one is uh, paying attention to me, and there is a third animal here. I only recognize it in the larger file. This little zebra is... <laughs> Again, looking to me between the bush. Some of the Tuan images are made in metropolitan area, inside cities, but we need, need to look for a special moment. Like here in Lisbon, Portugal, I was looking for a picture of Blaine Tower, the famous tower of the city. It's a World Heritage area. But when they switch off the light, so I got a good local contact, they, who told me that there is going to be a switch off this night and some areas nearby. So it's, a, it's an occasion to see stars above this tower. Otherwise, the floodlight illuminating the tower uh, doesn't let you to take anything of the sky unless you do exposure blending or any kind of photocomposite. So my images are not so far photocomposite. This technology, of course, enables to do much more, but I prefer to challenge myself with single exposures, usually. Here's a closer view of Taurus, the Pleiades, and uh, Jupiter. How long an exposure? This is about 10 seconds. You yeah. Not moving the camera, yes, on a fixed tripod. I have sometimes, uh, I have a tracking mount that sometimes I track, like that picture of Orion Nebula uh, with a little bit of landscape, it was on a tracking drive. But if you use a tracking drive, then your foreground will be blurred. Mm -hmm. So there is need, need to be a balance between the two. When the sky is bright, there is no reason to use a tracking drive. So many images made in the cities too, like this one from Boston. It has actually a conjunction of two planets and the moon. Um, but first pe people look at the similar scenery and then they connect with the night sky. That's the trick we use. From Boston, now to the another side of the city where you have another celestial <coughs> phenomena going on. It's hard to see it in this uh, wide field image, but let's have a closer look. A very close conjunction of two brightest planets in the sky, Venus and Jupiter. Most you know, people living in the city just pass by and never see this, uh, this two beacon in the sky because we are so much, you know, uh, occupied by our uh, urban, urban lifestyle. 
I, I noticed many people passing by next to me and they were looking what I'm shooting and I was trying to explain them. And then they were just walking for another, you know, 100, 200 me meters and they were just looking at these two planets and wondering why they have not noticed that before. <laughs> Sometimes you're in a very light polluted area, but you're lucky, like this one. I told my wife, we were in an astronomy conference in Greece and I told my wife for the first time in our life, we are going somewhere where there is no way to do astrophotography. <laughs> <laughs> and it's called Santorini Island because it's dominated by lights. At night, it's just full of light, everyone, you know, in party and hotels here and there. But then we got there and the power station exploded for 40, <laughs> 48 hours. It was on fire. It was, it was um, a pity for the islanders, but then tourists and islanders themselves realize what they're missing. Just look at this couple here. They're sitting next to a candle on the table, waiting for their dinner and enjoying the Milky Way, something that never happens here. But if you're looking for somewhere with permanent uh, blackout, I recommend you this island. It looks like an island here, but this is a country. You know, you can see the border of South Korea and North Korea. So this is a paradise uh, for astrophotographers who are okay to have a one-way ticket. <laughs> An image made by an astronaut, I think it's made by Don Pettit, who is also an astrophotographer, in fact, and we are in a very close contact. Uh, he, he, he's doing astrophotography when he's up in the space, uh, even image of comets and anything. So either him or one of his colleagues has done this. Most of the ISS images are made by Nikon DSLR cameras, some of the cameras we also use on the Earth. So another aspect of Tuan, as Wendy mentioned in the beginning, is this universality message. We try to break uh, the board, the political borders and bring this peaceful message of one people, one sky by showing the diversity of the religious landmarks and cultural landmarks of every country and then show it under one roof, one eternal roof above all of us. When the moon rises over Taj Mahal in India, within a few hours, people in Iran can see it over Persepolis. A few hours later, the same view is appreciated in Greece and then over the Atlantic in the U.S. So we are just sharing the same view and we can connect together, breaking the borders uh, from this perspective. That's why many of our images are made over uh, important cultural sites. That Comet Hale Bob, these images were made 10 years before Tuan were launched, but these photographers were doing that long before. We have even a Tuan photographer doing this 20, from 20 years before I was born. So, have you, uh, any of you here, uh, have seen Comet Hale Bob? 97? No. So, that was the best comet so far for the Northern Hemisphere in the past few decades. There were better comets in the southern hemisphere, like Comet Macnaught in 2007, but unfortunately not in the northern hemisphere. Night sky over Himalayas. Now we continue the tour with some historic landmarks, or even prehistoric one. This is a petroglyph area, rock art area in central Iran. Some of the pictures are made almost 20,000 years ago, you can find Ice Age animals. And there are different layers, uh, like people made pictures when uh, the first you know, riders started to appear in the Middle East 6,000 years ago, but there are also Ice Age animals on, the, on another side of the rock. So another tomb, this is the tomb of Cyrus the Great in Iran, 2,500 years ago. Jupiter is over there. It was a difficult image with the light pollution in the nearby area. 
this is this is a light from a single house so you can imagine you know at night time any kind of bright light becomes really intense to not only to the camera also to human eyes now we are in china image by my colleague pk chen under a very bright moon to paris it was actually midnight in Paris, not only for the film. Uh, I, had, uh, I watched the film very uh, recently before the image, and I had this idea to make an image in midnight in Paris. At that time, I was living in Germany at the border of France. It was easily to commute there. And I realized um, I can make a single exposure picture of the setting moon over the arc and the Champs-Élysées on this night, around midnight. But Unfortunately, the location that made this possible was in the middle of the street. <laughs> so I ended up captured by French police. But it was okay. You know, we have been captured all over the world. That's uh, kind of our reputation. <laughs> and we usually uh, end this with a very peaceful class about astronomy to, to the officer. Most of the time it worked. Historic tower in Iran, a minaret with the full moon, an analog image I made in 96 or 97. Now we are in southeast border of Iran and Pakistan, and uh, sometimes you, you're surprised with what you get at night. It's a natural stargazer, a face looking up to the sky in the past few million years. So light pollution is intense and is a problem uh, not only for astronomers, but uh, also for the environment in general. So it's important to, to want photographers to highlight this issue. And that's why we often go to places with light pollution to, to capture that and bring the message, show the contrast as well. So see what happens in Europe. Almost everywhere is brightening up. See here is Cairo, the Nile River. And then over there, Sicily, Italy, Madrid, Paris, Berlin over there. So all these countries are growing in light. The same is happening here too, except for those areas who are now protected. For example, in the U.S., this amazing program, Dark Sky program in the U.S. National Park has been very successful to protect the last remaining natural night sky of this continent. Here we are in Boston, another image by an ISS astronaut using a telephoto lens and shooting through the window of ISS and capturing um, the city lights in our, in our area. Here, for example, here you can get this contrast between Boston area light polluted city and up there in Maine when there is no where there is no light pollution. You can see pristine night sky within two, three hours drive. This is another example. The field of view of these two images are very similar. The orientation is also very similar. So you expect to see this night sky in this picture too, but there is nothing visible. But the most surprising fact is that the locations are only 40 miles separated. One in Tehran, metropolitan of 13 million people, and the other one in Alborz Mountains between Tehran and the Caspian Sea in Iran. So that's the same mountain, Mount Damavand on the left side. We're back in Boston with the moon uh, setting over the western horizon. Perhaps most of people living in those apartments had no time to just enjoy this view. This is, you know, perhaps a routine of uh, city life, but we can break this isolation of night sky and bring, that, bring back this forgotten part of nature. Closer view. In Dubai. It's really dominated by lights, and since it's a dusty area, the light pollution is scattered even further and there's only few stars visible in the entire sky even in a clear night where dust is not really dominant. I was captured here too by the way. 
because in some countries you need a special permission to shoot at night on a tripod. But nobody knows where to get this permission. <laughs> We, we look very suspicious to people, and especially to officers at night, you know, look, going around with this tripod and big um, lens on a camera at night, red light coming out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing this in a village, in a remote area, you don't want to show up in the middle of night to villagers. So first you introduce yourself in daylight that I'm going to do this, so you don't want to surprise them at night because they don't see, you know, you on top of a hill with the red light coming out of your head. Oh, Tuan photographer. <laughs> this image by my colleague John Goldsmith from Australia is very striking. You know, it's uh, during a celebration in Sydney, so they had even further light on Opera, Opera House, a world heritage of Sydney. But look at those trails next to stars above. These are birds. And these birds are not supposed to be this active at this time of night. Because of the insects uh, gathered here and the light itself, the, these are attractive to the birds. So many of the migrating birds are actually captured by floodlights in the cities. So their migration route is changed and they end up dying around these lights. And I have noticed this in many other cities of the world. Here, I captured the same thing over Budapest. By both, by both, yeah. So that's why we really respect the night sky. It's not only from an astronomer point of view, like my friend, amateur astronomer Bruce Berger of Boston area. It's also important to environmentalists, it's important to anyone living on this planet as part of our nature. So the natural night skies are something to respect, something to preserve as part of our natural heritage. This is a very recent picture, another one of those with a face in. You have seen a face in Iran, this was a face in Cinco Terre of Italy. We do this project with the observatories around the world to document their nighttime environment. Uh, we had a lot of collaboration with ESO, but also growing with other observatories too. If you want to see some of the world's observatories, night escapes, that's the short link. We have already documented about 40 of them, um, not only in visible light. This is Parnal in Chile but we also captured uh, the environment around it, like this is La Silla, the <coughs> observatory on the backdrop, but this area on the outer skirt of Atacama Desert was the purpose of this 360 degree panorama of the Milky Way. The green and red, by the way, these are air glow, but not so intense. Venus and the zodiacal light is rising in the morning hours. Also, the uh, non-visible light observatories, like on Alma. The challenge on Alma is, of course, the altitude. At almost 16,000 feet, you need to use oxygen capsule. And I'm going there in a few months. Uh, I need to do exam. Every time I go there, I need to do exam as someone who works on high altitude. You need to take this special test. or radio telescope. An image I captured in July when there was this all of a sudden surprise at pan stars. It was not supposed to be bright, but after uh, passing through the closest distance with the sun, it all of a sudden brightened up to naked eye visibility with a nice, uh, nice tail next to the moon. So it's another single exposure image. The dynamic range was huge. I used a tracking drive for this picture, for example, but I didn't use it too much, otherwise this would be too blurred. If you look at it from this distance, you can see it's not that sharp because of the tracking drive, but from further distance, it's okay. So this is the Parkes Radio Telescope, perhaps the most productive uh, 
or well-known radio telescope on Earth, um, which was recently also joined the SETI program with the budget came in that regard. Telescopes to observe gamma rays, of course, not directly on Earth, but the, um, the light caused by the gamma rays. This one is on La Palma, a 17-meter dish. A couple of them are there. Mauna Kea, Hawaii, with the lasers, the optic lasers coming out of Keck telescope. From Hawaii to Boston area, where my friend Mario Mota is running his personal observatory next to the bedroom. So this observatory is perhaps one of the largest amateur-based um, telescopes and, in the world. And he, he also do some science-related projects to, for example, track uh, transit of exoplanets and so on, as well as vari other variable star observation. Uh, so this is a classic way of doing uh, observatory dome photography. I let him uh, just turn around the dome during the exposure, and that's why the dome appears almost transparent. Some pictures are culturally oriented. I made this for um, an organization in Brazil. So for them, of course, the... Uh, sugar cans are important, but more important is the star up there, the Southern Cross. The reason is that the Southern Cross, they see it almost every day in daytime too, in their flag. For an, from an astronomer point of view, this is the most beautiful flag, I would say. <laughs> so many stars. Some of them are accurate too. <laughs> Southern Cross, an image by my colleague John Goldsmith, is the name of several towns in Australia, too. Constellation photography, as I said, some of our images are made uh, with purpose of use for science education and outreach. Like this one, the first view is just, it's made uh, for Tuan Planetarium Show. It's a project we're working on, and we hope to launch Tuan Planetarium Show uh, early next year. The show is already made, but we need to fine-tune it and then release it in different languages, mainly for live presentations. So I'm looking to discuss this with the planetarium in Boston too soon. And uh, the, the view down in the foreground is very famous landmark in Germany, but most German cannot recognize it. Any German here? Oh, yes. Oh, then you can recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> The reason they cannot recognize Neu Schwanstein because this fisheye view it just gives another perspective. And at the first glance, it, it appears unusual. You can recognize this one for sure in Yellowstone National Park. It's the old faithful geyser. Uh, it's very routinely appearing again, so it's very easy to take picture of it because you know it happens every 90 minutes, very sharp. But when, what you don't know is that there are also bears around, not only in the sky, <laughs> including grizzly bears which you don't want to mess up with. I had planned to do a picture of the geyser on the backdrop there, it's just one mile away or less, and on the way there were a couple of them sitting, midnight, on the road, you know, sitting and probably chatting together. I waited for quite some time, but they, they didn't move. So I didn't manage to take that picture. So these are 20 seconds apart. Another perspective of education use image, uh, made this in 36 degrees north in Iran in December, 36 degrees south in December, but in Australia. So you can see the season has changed, Orion is upside down on the left image. This one by Tunç Tezel, my Turkish colleague, is also very smartly done because he has uh, captured the whole Milky Way in two pictures. 
one from the southern sky, New Zealand, another one from Turkey. Or this one by my colleague Wally Paholka of Southern California shows the Arches National Park in a moonlit night and moonless night. Some people in Tuan are more on the art side, like Laurent Lavater, he's known for his moon games, moon for dinner. In fact, if she waits a bit more, she can also have Venus for dinner too. Moon games, so Laurent is living in Brittany of France. And for a French photographer, it's typical to be more on the art side. <laughs> Some images are longer exposure, like this one is a total exposure of one hour of, over petroglyph in central Iran. Star trails around the celestial pole, but you can also do multi-exposure images. This is a multi-exposure of every seven minutes the moon is setting over Rio. It looks like a complete photo composite, but it's actually not because it's a simple multi-exposure. It's still a composite, but not a montage or so on. Because the exposures are all the same. Camera is fixed. Every seven minutes, it's taking one shot. And in the last shot, I captured this when the sun was above the horizon. So before this shot, everything was dark. Only the moon was appearing in the picture. In that last shot, you see all the rest, the, the birds and all the scenery, because the sun was up and the exposure setting was the same, but the light was changing very fast. Another example, it's a single shot of a sequence with this communication tower in Tehran. It's a telephoto image, 400 mil. And when I put all the images together in this sequence, it creates a moon trail instead of a star trail. Moon trail in Vienna. So celestial events are also occasions to do night escape photography. There are some of these events that communicate with anyone on this planet because they're so magnificent, like a great comet, Comet Mach Naught, an image made by Akira Fuji. We are very honored to have him in Tuan Group because he has inspired many of us. He's a Japanese farmer and photographer who has done many of these pioneer work uh, in night escape photography in the 80s and 90s mainly. But you don't really get that bright comet very often. What you usually get in night sky is a comet like that. Can you find it in the upper left? That's another comet at the uh, limit of naked eye visibility. I was almost hopeless that night because the comet was next to the moon. I was looking for this conjunction, but then the sky over the horizon of La Palma was cloudy. The rest was clear, but right at the horizon. But I had that gap for a few seconds before the moon was setting, and all of a sudden this astronomer turned his car, and the backlight of the car just illuminated the observatory too. So it's sometimes about technique, art, sometimes about the moment. Like this is another example of a moment, a shot I made um, just a month ago in Kenya at Kilimanjaro area uh, during the torrid meteor shower. So that's moon, highly overexposed because of the exposure time. The rest are planets along the zodiacal light, uh, along the um, ecliptic, and uh, it's a fireball. Sometimes you see fireballs, but you don't capture them because wherever you point your camera, the meteor happens another way. You know, we are inside a period of meteor shower. In fact, the strongest meteor shower of the year usually happens December 14 in the morning, called Gemini. People know Perseid more because it's in a pleasant night of August. But in December, very few people go outside in a frozen night to enjoy meteors. Uh, but Geminis are usually better than per se in, in number, in average number of meteors. When you don't see a meteor, uh, don't capture a meteor, but you see it, you can point your camera, and this is what happens after the meteor. 
if it's bright enough. It's, if it's a fireball, it, it will leave, um, there, there will be something called persistent meteor train left after a fireball. This image starts one minute after the fireball, going all the way to 45 minutes later. It was visible to naked eye for 20 minutes. Here's a shot, 45 minutes later. It's a very noisy shot because it's enhanced a lot. Captured in northern Maine. Lunar and solar eclipses. Of course, solar eclipses are more dramatic, like this one I captured in the middle of the ocean in 2009. It was the longest of the century, almost seven minutes. The next one comes on March 9. Many people are traveling to Indonesia to see it. A closer view at the same time with a telescope, not too easy to handle on, on a moving ship. <laughs> Conjunctions to bright planets, this very old church, a cathedral at the border of Iran and Armenia. Zodiacal light, northern or central Maine, uh, Pemaquit Lighthouse not far from Boston, in fact. You can see the Portland um, light pollution at the horizon, but it's a small town. It doesn't really conflict that much with the natural night of sky. Venus is shining in the morning hours, so you can compare the light of the winter Milky Way and the zodiacal light. In fact, the zodiacal light is even brighter than the Milky Way in this season. Aurora Borealis is shot by my colleague uh, Dennis Mamana from Southern California, who regularly goes to Alaska for aurora imaging. It's a panorama, in fact, and it's made on film in 2002 from Denali, Denali National Park. Here is another one in Norway. Um, aurora can happen any time at such latitude. It was 69 degrees north, so quite far in the north. Or this one in Sweden, near Kiruna in northern Sweden. Uh, some people say it's like an angel, some say it's a butterfly, so a lot of figures up there. But definitely sometime aurora is quite spooky. <laughs> this one by Yuichi Takasaka, he lives in Canada. He's an aurora photographer. You don't want to be there at night with this figure, you know, alone. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very entertaining because uh, they happen all of a sudden in all figures. And when you know the science behind, it's also very interesting to just watch them. Uh, as you can see, the aurora is illuminating the whole foreground for me in this picture. Now in motion. Time-lapse video made with a fisheye lens showing uh, three, four hours of night where there is a solar storm happening. Aurora is very active in polar latitudes. There is one expected for tonight as well, but it's not going to be bright enough to see from this latitude, probably central Maine, northern Maine. It's also very interesting to see aurora from these two perspectives, like images by Don Pettit from the ISS, you're above aurora. And then by Tuan Photographer, you're below aurora. Back in the space, you can see red aurora is quite higher. Green is at the edge of atmosphere, almost 70, 60 miles. Back in the desert in Iran. Another interesting phenomenon in the sky, which is usually not visible to unaided eyes, is air glow, because it needs to be very intense, and you need to be a casual observer, a trained observer to recognize them. Right now, there is no air glow. This is Canopus over uh, Canary Islands. But now, here comes the air glow. Look at those patches, the red patches appearing in the sky. And time lapse are moving. 
If you look with your own eyes in real time, they're, of course, very slow. As uh, most of you are astronomers, you know this is quite a pain for astronomers to get rid of. Air glow is nothing interesting for most astronomers because it's different to fil difficult to filter, and when they become uh, intense, they're increasing the background, the sky brightness. But they're related to solar activity. What is this? What kind of atmospheric or celestial phenomena we are showing here. It's happening every day, before sunset and after sun, sun. Shadow of the Earth, yeah, exactly. It's also called, as you mentioned, Belt of Venus. Uh, the upper layer is usually called the Belt of Venus, that purple area. The blue is the shadow of the Earth. And when the sky is transparent, like here near the ocean, you also get to see it easily, even from a city. But here we were on high altitude, and it's a perfect place to see the shadow of the Earth. After sunset, you look to the opposite direction, or before sunrise. Halos, like this one, which many people communicate with it as a Batman logo, <laughs> <laughs> over Germany. Halos even around the stars. These are atmospheric phenomena interesting to night escape photographer too. Satellites, iridium flares or this one, which is made by my colleague Tomasz Ladany from Hungary. It's the ISS, the space station. Why there are gaps between the trail? Because it's a photo sequence. So every 10 seconds there is a new picture and one second gap for the camera to load again. So the space station is moving between these frames. Why the gaps are larger near the top of the image? Because the station is getting closer to us overhead. We have this section on Tuan called Mystery. Of course, they're all explained naturally. <laughs> <laughs> but this one was very surprising to me. Another rather noisy picture because it's old from 10 years ago in digital. And I was completely blown away when I saw this. It was first a star and then some cloud around it. At the time, I was not aware that uh, these, these phenomena is also frequently observed by others around the planet. These are left from uh, rocket programs when there is a rocket sent to space and there are extra fuel dumping outside of the rocket, um, the sun the sunlight get reflected from the cloud above the atmosphere and make this huge um, huge cloud in the night sky. Then I put together examples by other photographers to show people that these are frequencies, these are not UFO. But of course we can understand, you know, if a villager in northern Finland see this, you know, they're not going to say, oh, this is a Russian rocket you know, with a problem in the second stage. <laughs> it's like a wormhole in the sky. <laughs> so it surprised a lot of people. Where, uh, wherever near Russia, you see more of them. <clears throat> like that one on the upper left is almost like a sperm but they're in very different um, shapes. But this, this kind of shape is uh, more frequently viewed. So yeah, the last part of my talk is about how I started. I started interested in as amateur astronomy uh, by traveling around by nature itself in 91. Uh, these were my colleagues. That was my first telescope, my Hubble Space Telescope at the time, the two-inch wide. And um, I continued as a science educator, writer, running a magazine in Iran on astronomy, uh, doing classes for people who, who is interested in astronomy. These, these are uh, regular faces of Iranians that you don't usually see on the news. Uh, amateur astronomers uh, from the Tehran area with their observing camp. Then I continued to travel around, found other friends, uh, like this one was for an eclipse uh, in Panama um, in 2005. 
I documented about 10, 12 solar eclipses. In 2007, I started Tuan and invited all the colleagues and best night escape photographers in the world to uh, become a team. And then we are also open to non-Tuan members. They can contribute to our guest gallery. They can uh, contribute to Tuan contest every year. The easiest way to find an image on Tuan is by search. Um, we deliver a lot of imagery to astronomy community educators uh, free of cost when it's for a non-profit program, uh, like for a lecture, for talk, education program. But we also sell a lot of these images for commercial use because we live from this. Every Tuan photographer uh, try to live from this, which is unfortunately not easy. So Tuan website is the main platform we communicate with people. We do physical exhibition too, but Tuan website is the main uh, gateway for us. And we have some of these uh, interesting visitors. I love to meet with this person, you know, because he's always active. We have checked Tuan stats here and there, and it's either a systematic error or there is really somewhere in Kerguelen Island visiting Tuan website every, every day almost. <laughs> and I've been to that island, but I didn't find the person <laughs> because this island is populated mainly by penguins. <laughs> it's an image from 2003. I was there on the way to Antarctica uh, trying to find that person. <laughs> So we do talks and exhibition. Uh, some of the exhibitions are also in digital way, like this one in, uh, in Austria, or in physical way in Australia. Kids love these images. As I said, this combination of landscape and sky is very interesting to kids and also to adults. The contest is open to everyone. It's free and it's very good exposure for photographers worldwide because our news get picked by National Geographic and many other agencies around the world are interested to reflect on the winners of um, the contest. It's the world's largest contest for this style at the moment. Next one will be announced in uh, March. And then we have workshops too. Some of them are locally here in the U.S. I do this international workshop every year on La Palma uh, in September, October. It's a week-long workshop where anyone interested to learn medium level, even advanced uh, style of this type of photography. And I'd like to finish it by this picture by my colleague Amir Abolfad from Iran. Uh, these couples are actually looking for their next home, which I really don't recommend that, that location towards the Galactic Center unless they want to live next to a black hole. So thank you, everyone. These are my contacts. And uh, I think we are going to continue a bit further on with Q&A. Thank you. some of them are fairly long exposure. How do you combat the issue of capturing orbiting objects or commercial flights? Oh, yes, yeah, that, that's a big yeah. It must be a real problem. You, sometimes you need to repeat several times. Sometimes you need to remove a plane from your picture at the end. Uh, satellites, we don't usually bother with because they're not that bright. Yeah. But let me tell you something. I, uh, we had a project together with a colleague in Germany. It was on a documentary film. So the documentary film was about the First World War. So we end up doing a lot of time-lapse uh, images of night sky for them, for them of videos. And each you know, 10-second time-lapse is several hundred pictures. Then the director asked, OK, this is a documentary about the First World War. We don't have a plane in the sky. <laughs> so every plane should be removed from the picture. Yeah. Sometimes it's a thing. I hope the software like uh, Adobe Photoshop or so on, they make a remove plane remover oh. function. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very useful. Like After Effects at the moment has a function for bird removing. Because in time lapse you don't see, you don't want to see birds you know, coming and going in fast mode. Joe? Oh, yeah. 
I was just curious about your the color calibration methods and how much of that is driven by, like if you have the Milky Way in the image, yes. how much of the color calibration is driven by the foreground or the Milky Way? Or Very good the question. It's, uh, it depends on the photographer. For me, it's more about the night sky. So I care about the natural color of the night sky, which is a big discussion between astrophotographers because some people say, if we don't see it, there is nothing natural. But some people say even what we see is not real, you know, because everyone has different perception of what we can see. But there are physical rules to follow. You know, if a star is red, that means there is intensity in red part of the spectrum. So the same thing for the Milky Way. And we have all these analog images made in the past, so we have ways to calibrate for the natural colors of the Milky Way. I have gave talks on that uh, for astrophotographers uh, around the world. It's one of my main interests. So I color calibrate based on astronomical objects. But there are people who also color calibrate based on the foreground. I would say if, if the picture is an astrophoto, then the night sky is more important. If it's a night escape general photo, like that picture of a mountain and stars, then the calibration is on the photo. Oh. Most of the time, when you do constellations that you showed when you connected the dots, were on the basis of a Western civilization. Yes. yes. Connected dots uh, background. Uh, have you reached out, or you know, I, I recently went to the Navajo that summer, and they have a different way and tradition uh, of connecting the dots and how that's important to their culture. Uh, this seems to be a very yes. good bridge for different cultural norms of connecting to the sky uh, across the world, let alone personally. We have, people. Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, occasion, in fact. We have done this on few places, but not as an overall project. We tried it in with Aboriginal people in Australia because we have a Tuan member who is a PhD in this field, astronomy and Aboriginal people. But we have not managed to done this um, other other places around the world. I have done this in Iran. Um, we also tried in Portugal. But there are so many good examples. Yeah, but there's a software, for example, Stellarium, the freeware software. Also, the World um, Worldwide Telescope. I think there are section a layer. Someone from Worldwide Telescope. They, they, they oh. just they have a <laughs> so there is a layer for ancient constellations by other cultures. And so there's a work going on on that, and yes, it's a good idea that we also get get involved. Great. Well, thank you okay, again. Okay.